Hey everyone, Tin Man here with the Ultimate Guide to Tin Pile, also known as Justice Primal Shadow Unitless Control, or JPS Control. It goes by a lot of names. In any case, it's my favorite deck, and I'm here to tell you all about it and all about every single card choice, metagame option that you could ever want to know about it. So this is an example of a complete list that I played this week in ETS. I think it's quite well suited for the current metagame, but as we'll discuss, that can change on a day-to-day -day, uh, or week-to-week -week basis. So for those of you unfamiliar with the deck, uh, we try to play as few units as possible, uh, really just running merchants because merchants are so powerful. And we try to invalidate and blank a lot of opposing removal spells. Other than that, we run a lot of our own removal spells, things like Annihilate, Harsh Rule, Slay, as well as card draw in the form of uh, Channel the Tempest, Wisdom of the Elders, and, um, and Strategize to kind of set up our hand and get to the late game where we win with the Sword of the Sky King, Last Word, or just Channel the Tempest them directly. So with that in mind, let's hop into what I would consider the core of the deck, where you kind of start with every list. And this is it. There's about four cards in it. It's a very small core, which really speaks to exactly how customizable the deck is. It really, every time you build this deck, you're going to have to build it kind of from scratch uh, to fight the metagame that you anticipate. So we definitely want to include merchants. The market mechanic is just so powerful right now. Being able to get whatever specific card that you want out of your five card market is very valuable. The actual unit itself is kind of a throwaway. I mean, if it gets value, if it trades with their unit, that's just, you know, a, a nice benefit. But the real benefit is, the, the real key to these cards is being able to access the exact cards you want exactly when you need it. Other than that, um, some of the spells that we're always going to include are probably going to be Vara's Favor. Uh, this really is just a power, but it does so much more. It pops Aegises, which are a pain to deal with. Since we don't have too many of our own units, we rely on spell effects to uh, deal with opposing units. And Wisdom of the Elder. Elders. Uh, this card is just exactly what we want. It's so simple, it's so efficient. Pay three, draw two. Uh, I'd play more than four if I could. It's, it's just that good and that uh, common that we always want this type of effect. Other than that, I would say Sword of the Sky King in some number, I put two down here is core to the deck. Um, it does a lot. I mean, it's very simple, right? Just eight cost, eight, eight weapon, but it helps you to win the game, you know, dealing eight to the eight to the face. Every turn will win the game in short order, but also gives you eight armor to be able to stabilize against aggressive decks who are trying to pressure your life total. So I would always play at least two, and in the current meta, I'm even playing up to four. Other than that, let's hop into what we're gonna fill out the rest of the deck with. Uh, let's start with the removal options. So the removal options, there's a lot of them, right? Uh, these are gonna make up the bulk of our extra cards outside of those core. And I've really listed every single option here. Uh, you're not gonna play all of these. You're not gonna play one of each of them or anything like that. Uh, this is just to kind of list everything that I've ever legitimately considered to include in the deck. And as you'll see, some of them are gonna be more common than others. So let's just start at the top here. Let's talk about Permafrost and Eye of Winter. Uh, they're kind of paired together uh, partially because they both do a similar effect, right? They both stun opposing units. Permafrost stuns it forever, and Eye of Winter can stun multiple guys but requires an investment every turn. I really don't like these cards all that much, um, primarily because when you just stun units, they are still on the board. So if you're trying to kill them with a Sword of the Sky King, for instance, you need to eventually actually kill those units. On top of that, um, there are some units that Permafrost and Eye of Winter don't hit. You know, Endurance units, namely. Sandstorm Titan is a very common one. Ikaria was until her nerf. Uh, so I try to stay away from these effects. They're a little too narrow, but if the meta dictates it, um, and if you really need that, you know, that cheap removal spell, um, it, it's a reasonable option, I suppose. Uh, the, the, the problem is, it's, since it's so narrow, its primary appeal is that one cost, 
but we don't really care about the one cost. We're going to go to late game anyway. It's not like we need to tempo them out with cheap removal. So I tend to stay away from these cards. Let's move down into our spells. Island's Intervention. This is a card that uh, most people probably don't even consider in this type of a deck, but it's kind of an extra torch type effect for flying units if there are a lot of, say, Unseen Commandos, Valkyrie Enforcers, um, even something like a Shelter Ring Rider to pop the Aegis. Uh, it's a reasonable card, I'd say. Uh, maybe not in every meta. Uh, the Negate a 3-cost enemy spell is relevant um, against things like Stand Together or Devastating Setback, but in reality this is a fairly niche card and I'd really only consider it if you're seeing a lot of TJP flyers that want to run Unseen Commando and Stand Together in the same deck. This answers a lot of their threats. Suffocate, this is actually a pretty commonly played card since it you know, kills something with three attack or less at a pretty cheap cost. Ideally you want to be hitting things that you don't that won't die to say a hailstorm um, or a lightning storm but also cost maybe more than one maybe you're hitting a two or three drop with this the perfect example is knight chancellor seraph this is really the, the primary target for suffocate but also in the pinch it can hit things like aurelian merchant initiative sands um, unseen commando a, a wide variety of early aggression um, and that you know, if you're seeing a lot of, uh, say, red decks, you there's better options than Suffocate as a one-for-one, one, but it's quite good against Combray aggro decks. Unstable Form. This is a card that is kind of good as a one-of. I like it a lot because not only is it a removal spell, it's also a card advantage spell because you can throw back the extra echo copy with, say, Strategize uh, or throw it into your market with your Gen of Merchants. Uh, and also it helps you to pop Aegis's kind of without card disadvantage, or at least not too much card disadvantage, because you just target the unit, it removes the Aegis, and then you kill the unit with another spell. So I like having like a one of these in a lot of metas, and also it provides you an out to things like Dawnwalker, which was one of the ways I lost in the ETS today, was unanswered Dawnwalkers. So having one in stable form is, uh, is fine. I wouldn't play too many because they don't actually kill the unit, they just upgrade it. And uh, you can, if you draw too many of these, you can kind of be flooded with no hard removal. Annihilate, uh, simple, easy, effective, very good into time mid-range type decks. Um, things like Sandstorm Titan, World Bearer Behemoth, the Nuvara, Vengeance Seeker. All of them are single faction units that die at, at an advantage to you. Uh, in the current meta, I'm packing quite a lot of Annihilates. But if the meta starts shifting to more double color units, um, you might want to swap from Annihilate over to Rindra's Choice, which is basically an, the same idea as Annihilate, but just more than one faction. Uh, Bring Down is good into flyers, flyer metas. Uh, even if the flyers aren't terribly meta, I still think it's quite decent as just a silence effect, similar to Unstable Form. It can give you an out to things like Dawnwalker, but it's at its best against uh, Inquisitor Mokdo, Ikarias, or Haunting Scream, because the guy they scream back will have flying. Uh, overall, I tend to keep this as a one of, um, unless the meta is really uh, skewed in that direction. Lightning Storm, the old reliable before Hailstorm was printed. Uh, this really has narrow applications. Um, I generally would play four Hailstorms before I play any Lightning Storms, and I. Lightning Storm is really only good against red-based aggro decks, you know, Oniron and Rakano Outlaw and things like that. Against uh, most decks that are trying to be aggressive have kind of evolved to be bigger and to uh, survive Hailstorm, let alone Lightning Storm. So uh, it would take a difficult, uh, you know, very aggressive meta to bring Lightning Storm back. But it's a good one to keep in the back of your mind, as, especially if a token meta starts popping up. Lightning Strike. I like this card a lot. It's one of our few ways of answering uh, relic weapons out of the opposed opponent. Things like a Sword of Akaria is just a big pain to deal with. Even uh, Auric Runehammer is annoying, unless if you don't have a Vara's Favor. So Lightning Strike gives you a good answer to opposing relic weapons, as well as, as, well as just dealing with uh, their normal early game attackers. It's quite good against charge units as well, kind of holding two mana open 
to be able to deal with whatever kind of charge units they could throw out, something like a Champion of Fury, Bandit Queen, Haunting Scream. Just gives you that extra you know, insurance that, that you're not going to get burned out by a charge unit at the end. Ranger's Choice, I kind of touched on this with the Annihilate. Um, it's the same concept if the decks are tending more towards double cost units, generally like Arjunport, like Tavrod. Um, you'll see Ringer's Choice, but I think Annihilate is often better just because there are more single faction units than double faction units. Torrential Downpour. This is kind of a poor man's lightning storm. It's even, even worse. Um, I would tend to shy towards Hailstorm and Lightning Storms before I go for the Downpour. And I guess if there's heavy token meta or Grenadin meta, perhaps... Uh, but generally you're going to want Lightning Storm or Hailstorm. They do kind of the same role, but, but better. Vanquish. This card, uh, a lot of people like Vanquish a lot, right? It's, it, there's a lot of threatening units that have more than four attack, or four or more. The problem is, Vanquish is narrow, right? It only kills things that are big, as opposed to some of our other options that we'll discuss here shortly. They kill anything. And that's, at that, for that uh, you know, drawback, you get a cheaper card and a card that's in a single faction. The problem is we don't really care the difference between paying two and three for something like Slay because, you know, we're ten intending to go to the late game. We don't need to kind of cast this for tempo as well as play a threat like some aggressive decks will. So overall, I tend to stay away from these kind of conditional removal spells, things like Vanquish or Permafrost. Uh, I think there's better options. Similarly with Aerial Battle, uh, it's a conditional removal spell, but a very powerful one at that, so I decided to include it. If, you know, TJP Flyers comes back into meta, or just any kind of flyer meta, um, you might look into uh, Aerial Battle, uh, along with things like Islands Intervention. If they hadn't nerfed Levitate to be 2 meta, you might be able to combo Levitate with things like Aerial Battle and Islands Intervention and Bring Down, but... Uh, at two mana, I don't think Levitate is really where we want to be. Devastating Setback. This is kind of a hybrid card in between a Lightning Storm and a Sabotage. And for that reason, if you're playing against a heavy aggressive meta and heavy control meta with not a lot of mid-range in between, you might look into Devastating Setback because the Sabotage mode will be good against control decks and the Lightning Storm mode will be good against aggressive decks. But it, neither mode is really that effective against something like a Sandstorm Titan deck. So I'd shy away from this if there's a lot of mid-range out there. Island's Choice. This is a very commonly played card. I would play this card a whole lot. It does a lot. It does have that kind of Vanquish effect, which, you know, I, like I was saying, Vanquish is reasonable. It is does have a drawback, but there's a lot of things that have four or more attack. The nice part about Island's Choice is that it's not so narrow like Vanquish. It also has a counter spell mode. You can negate the enemy spell with cost four or more. Most spells that you care about cost four or more. Things like Great Parliaments, Opposing Channel the Tempests, um, or Obliterates against aggressive decks. This will help you to feel a little more secure um, if you're holding this, this up. Extract. This card is so good against red-based aggro. It looks a little innocuous. I mean, yeah, you gain three, you deal three, but seriously, three damage, three health is a ton to help you stabilize. And don't discount the scout either. Scout effects are pretty good here to help uh, ensure that you're hitting your power drops on time, as well as um, you know continuing to play your game. Scouts are, are definitely relevant. Also, it has applications against control decks, being able to kill face aegis or relic weapons. So if opponents are playing a lot of those type of things, you know, there's a lot of aggression and a lot of control that runs relic weapons, you might look into extract. But once again, similar to Devastating Setback, it doesn't do a whole lot against mid-range decks. Hailstorm. Uh, we kind of touched on this on a couple occasions, but Hailstorm... A lot of people might think it's core to a deck like this, but it really isn't. A lot of decks are really adapting to not be that weak to Hailstorm. So with that in mind, you know, if people are not respecting the existence of Hailstorm, by all means include it. If people are shying away from decks that are weak to Hailstorm, 
then maybe your, your removal slots are better spent elsewhere. But it's going to be a pretty commonly played card, and, and it's one of the more, more uh, common choices here. Polymorph, mm, I included it for completion's sake, but really I've never played this. Uh, the fact that they still get to keep a guy around is kind of annoying, because even as a 1-1, one -one, that'll deal damage to you. You know, you're not... Um, you don't have a blocker, really, <laughs> to, to block it other than the merchants. Um, so I would tend to stay away from something like Polymorph and instead play things more like Slay. Uh, simple, easy, effective. This is a card you're going to play a lot. Uh, you're going to play a lot of Slays. If opponents are playing units, you're going to play Slay. The exact number is up for a debate. Uh, some metas, you know, they're running a lot of kind of uh, Entomb triggers or... Um, or charge units, maybe you don't want quite as many slays and instead prefer things like Lightning Strike or Feeding Time or Death Strike. Uh, but in most metas, you're going to run a good number of slays. Similar with Death Strike, this card actually, it's also effective, it's also simple and efficient, but costing four and being fast and actually having a diff more difficult color requirement, Double Shadow is harder than Justice Shadow, is definitely a drawback. Um, I would probably play this a little less than I'm going to play something like Lightning Strike or Island's Choice because they fill a similar role in killing an attacker or killing a charge unit. You don't really need to tempo them out with Death Strike. Um, you really just, the fast is just relevant against charge units, in which case there's kind of better options. Feeding Time is Slay Plus. Slay plus also transform it into a pig. So this is key against things like Inquisitor Mokto or Dawnwalker. Those cards make your life a living nightmare. You need to have something like a feeding time or a silence effect or um, or like an unstable form to, to prevent them from coming back over and over and over again because those can definitely run you out of cards real quick. Um, overall, I, I generally play a little bit less of these than Slay, but it's definitely meta-dependent. Harsh Rule. I kind of talk about Harsh Rule and End of the Story at the same time. They're you know, similar effects. Um, harsh Rule is almost core to the deck. Uh, I really debated putting it in the core section, uh, but the reality is sometimes it's just not that great. You know, sometimes people aren't running that many mid-range decks or that many, you know, medium aggro decks. If they're running really fast aggro, you're better off with something like Hailstorm or Lightning Storm. If they're running, you know, really big control, well, you don't want any of these. So, but the fact that it's so generically applicable, most opponents are playing units, Harsh Rule um, is going to see play quite a bit. Generally, you're going to want End of the Story as Harsh Rules 5 and 6, uh, or maybe even 7 if you're going that deep. Uh, it's generally worse just because it costs one more. The warp is not irrelevant. Sometimes you do warp it in. But most of the times the tribute effect is not applicable. Strain to Shadows is the last removal option we're going to talk about here. Uh, this is worse in general than Harsh Rule and End of the Story, but is better against specifically Dawnwalkers because it kills them dead. They have minus four even in the void so they can't come back. Also against kind of reanimator strategies like Haunting Scream, it'll kill all of their targets um, for good. They can't scream them back. But that's rare that those kind of decks are dominating. And generally you're gonna want Harsh Ruler end of the story more, of, more than Strange Shadows. So that's all the removal options here. Let's move on to the next section. Let's move on to the card draw section. So these are the card draw options for the deck outside of the Wisdom of the Elders, which you're definitely going to be playing. Let's talk about the first one, Wanted Poster. This is a card that is at its best against mid-range decks or against control decks that kind of present one threat per turn, something like Old School Feln with Champion of the Cunning or Black Sky Harbinger. In those, against those decks, they're generally going to play out one big threat per turn, you know, one Sandstorm Titan, one um, World Bear Behemoth. Then you can take the time to cast one poster plus a slay or plus a harsh rule and kind of recoup that card or that card advantage. The This is not at its best against aggressive aggro decks, but it's reasonable there. I mean, you can throw it on a guy and then, you know, hailstorm it away and still draw your cards, but 
um, paying two mana against aggressive decks, you just don't often have time to do that. You do want to be afraid of silence effects, much like with permafrost. Uh, if you throw this on a unit and don't kill it right away, they could potentially play a Valkyrie Enforcer, and then you're very sad that they just got a card advantage out of that. So be wary, but against mid-range metas, you definitely want to be playing some number of wanted posters. Staff of Stories, I'm not thrilled with. Um, it's really only good against hardcore control decks that are not attacking you, because then you can just generate card after card. It's also better in decks that run uh, things like Throne Warden or War Cries to buff up your relic weapons uh, and give extra armor, but we don't really have that. And it kind of overlaps some of the other relic weapons we're going to discuss here shortly. So in general, I try to stay away from Staff of Stories as a card draw engine. Call the deck. So let's talk about some of these card selection cards rather than card advantage. You know, this doesn't actually net you any cards, neither does Strategize unless you're throwing back um, an unstable form. So I really don't like strategize and call the deck. I, I know a lot of people think strategize is core to the deck, and I really don't. I, I'm, I'm very close to cutting it because your deck is very homogenous, right? You've got, you basically have only have a couple type of cards, right? You've got power, you've got removal spells, and you've got um, card advantage or card draw. So most of the time, any card that you would draw is a good card. It's very rare that you've got a hand and be like, ooh, I've got, you know, I've got too much power. That's pretty rare. You want to get up to eight and nine power consistently, uh, as opposed to, say, a mid-range deck that's like, I don't want more than my five power I need. Um, it's also rare that you're just like, yeah, I just don't have, you know, I need to dig for my one removal spell. <laughs> Your whole deck's removal spells, right? Uh, you don't need to dig towards a threat. You don't have any threats. <laughs> I mean, you have a few, but they're they're a very late game. So generally, I look at hands in the mid game, and I'm like, yeah, this hand's perfect. Like, I just don't want to strategize. There's nothing I want to throw away. Nothing I want to call the deck for. Or as opposed to just drawing any random card off the top, which I could do and not have to spend two power on. So with that in mind, um, if you are going to play strategize, which... To be fair, it's still a good card to avoid those flood situations and to kind of smooth out your early game. Um, the one piece of advice I would say is that if you are going to cast Strategize, make sure you know exactly why you are casting it. You should be able to articulate, I'm digging for a power because I'm short on power. Or I have a card that I know is irrelevant. You know, you have a, a harsh rule against a control deck that is not going to play more than one guy maybe. Um, or you, you have you know an unstable form that you know you want to throw back one copy of. If you don't know exactly why you're playing it, or the card you know you want to throw away, don't cast it. Wait until you do. If you're like, yeah, my hand's perfect, I don't really want to throw anything back, don't. Just, just wait. Just wait. Other options include Herald Song. So this is kind of paired with Privilege of Rank. Um, it makes an awkward uh, mana base if you want to do this, but it is an efficient card draw engine. You know, Herald Song is two cards, just like Unstable Form, so you get the extra one. Each one individually is a card disadvantage, but if you use the first one to discard the echoed copy, you net out uh, even, and it's kind of like a build your own strategize type effect. But when you discard something like Privilege of Rank, you get to draw the two Justice Sigils from your deck um, kind of for value there and makes a little card draw engine on it. I don't really like this, unless your mana base is heavily skewed to add extra justice sigils, but as I'm gonna discuss a little bit later on, the mana base in this deck is kind of rough. So uh, I don't really like to play that many justice sigils that would encourage this type of a build. This is kind of a better engine in, in a two color deck. Swindle. Now you might be thinking, how are we ever gonna get spark with Swindle? And, fair question, but it does happen against control decks. You've got merchants, you've got relic weapons that can attack them, but it's generally, this is just a card that uh, if you're playing against control deck meta where wanted poster might not have a target, um, you could do worse than Swindle as a one or two of in addition to your uh, other card draw spells. Celestial Omen, now this isn't 
card advantage, just like Strategize and Call the Deck, and it's been mostly made obsolete by the advent of Merchants. Merchants now kind of provide you that uh, selection, uh, that find that silver bullet type of card. So I generally avoid Celestial Omen, but if you are going to play it, make sure you're playing it into a meta where there's a lot of slower decks that aren't going to punish you for just paying six and not impacting the board. Channel the Tempest. So when I started writing this article, Channel the Tempest was absolutely core to the deck. Three in the main, one in the market, every time, lock it in, when it cost eight power. Unfortunately, it was deemed too good at eight power, and now it costs nine. So it's moved away from core to the deck to more of a, an option. Uh, despite how late this, game, this deck likes to go, occasionally we don't get to nine power. You know, we kind of stall out around seven or eight. And then when you have a when you have a channel on eight, then you're like, oh yeah, I definitely get up to 10, 11, 12 power. That's because you drew three extra cards. Uh, but if you're stuck around eight, it might be a little while till you get to nine. If you are gonna play a lot of channel of tempests, uh, I would recommend going higher than my normal amount of power. Uh, maybe even playing uh, extra card draw like wanted poster to make sure that you can continue to remove their guys and draw power to get up to nine power. But I generally, um, I think we're, I would always like to have one channel in the market if you're playing Genev Merchant, but not too many in the main, maybe just one. All right, after card draw, let's head over to the Relic Weapons section. You generally, there's five options here for Relic Weapons, and I generally like to run um, Sword of the Sky King. It's kind of core to the deck, um, but you can add additionals uh, as needed. Uh, I generally like to stick towards five or six kind of late game win conditions, things like Sword of the Sky King, Channel the Tempest, and Last Word. Altogether, you generally want about five or six of those type effects. Uh, I'll talk about Last Word a little bit. It is generally a little bit worse than Sword of the Sky King because, you know what, it's very vulnerable. It could just die for one damage. But it's very powerful against mid-range decks that are only playing kind of one threat per turn. You know, they're top decking, they top deck a big fatty, you play last word and kill it. Now they're under pressure to top deck another fatty. And if they don't, at any point, you can just pay nine and kill them if they don't have a blocker. And if they don't, well, you're still just eating one guy for free per turn. A common play pattern with this is you play the last word, kill their guy, they play another guy, you just pay nine and then kill their, their new blocker. And then they're just like, and then you don't play anything else because you just spent nine to ultimate this. And now if they play another thing, well, now you can cast your harsh rule or your slay or your removal spell and attack them directly. Uh, you kind of split that ultimate and removal spell over two turns. So overall, I really do like having this as a one of in, in a lot of the decks, uh, especially when there's a lot of mid-range decks out there. If you're up against a deck that might have direct damage burn, uh, make sure you have a facey just before you play this. And also be wary of Nightfall triggers, because that will pop this right off. Other than that, there are um, two other relic weapons that I consider very um, very commonly played. Auric Runehammer and Duelist Blade. They serve a similar purpose in kind of that mid-range relic weapon spot that can really help you to kill off Aegis units. Things like Sheriff Marley or Copper Hall Elite. Uh, Auric Runehammer is kind of always good it's never amazing you know against aggro decks well it only has one uh one armor and is probably going to be destroyed on the backswing because they probably have more than one guy against mid-range there's not a ton that you're gonna kill for four titans behemoths things like that don't die to it against control decks well it only has one armor so they can ping it off with a scorpion wasp or Avara's favor or a lot of things but it's kind of always acceptable even if it's never amazing in contrast to duelist blade duelist blade is quite good against aggressive decks you know that four armor and aegis prevent you from getting burned out you, know, you gain four life their torch now you have an aegis to stop their torch or their obliterate and it also kills their unit Against control decks, for the same reason, it's quite good. You know, four armor is much harder to get through with little pings like Vara's Favor or uh, Scorpion Wasp or Desert Marshal. And the 
Aegis prevents them, them from casting things like Sabotage or Channel the Tempest directly on you. So this is better against aggro and control decks, but is a little bit worse against mid-range decks because just like Oric Runehammer, you're probably not going to kill anything. And if you do, well, it's just going to die right away. Whereas Runehammer, you get to stick it around for an extra turn. So summarize, Runehammer is better uh, just as a general card, whereas Duelist Blade is against non-midrange metas. But generally, you just want one of these two and not both because they will overlap and you'll kind of feel awkward having them both in your hand. Another note, Runehammer costs double justice, which can be a problem to get on turn four, especially if you're trying to get untapped um, power on turn four, undepleted. Uh, we're going to discuss the power issues in a little bit here, but that's definitely problematic. And that's that should be considered a feather in the cap for Duelist Blade, that it's much easier to cast. The last relic weapon I want to talk about is Life Drinker. Now this is a card I've never actually played, but I've always considered it uh, in very fast, aggressive metas. When you combo Life Drinker with a Lightning Storm or Hail Storm, all that damage to all of their units is life stealed back to you. So... On like a turn five, you can cast this plus Lightning Storm and gain a ton of life against decks that are going wide against you. That being said, it's really only good against red aggro and pretty much nothing else. So I'm going to avoid this unless the meta gets really crazy in favor of something like Skycrag or, um, or a token go wide strategy meta. Uh, but it's good to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, I guess on that note, also, last word, uh, the fact that it gives you deadly makes your Hailstorms and Lightning Storms kill every unit it hits. Same with Vara's Favor. Now Vara's Favor be basically becomes a slay as well. So just it rarely comes up, but it's good to note. All right, and there's one last section, just kind of the other <laughs> section. So this is a collection of 15 cards here that... Uh, don't really fall into the other categories, um, so I'll talk about them um, on their own terms here. So you'll notice there's a unit section here, and remember what I was saying that uh, we don't like to play units? Um, well, we don't like to play units, but there are a handful of units that I think have very impactful summon effects or are otherwise immune to removal. Uh, so Scourge of Frost Home is otherwise immune to removal. You know, our whole concept of our deck is that your opponent is going to be playing things like Vanquish or Slay or Xena Initiation or Permafrost. And uh, and we just want to strand those in hand and just accept that and that, hey, we just got card advantage because they drew their Slay. And Scourge of Frost Home continues that trend because they can't cast those spells that you're stranding. It can often be a trump against uh, opposing control decks. But unfortunately, some of the more common control decks right now are running um, either Sword of the Sky King or Scorpion Wasp or Desert Marshal, kind of non-spell ways to deal with Scourge. So probably not its best right now, but you might want to consider this as a one-of in your market if, um, if kind of this tin pile deck becomes very popular, because it's quite good against this tin pile. <laughs> Uh, the other two, Steward of the Past and Copperhall Bailiff, have very powerful summon effects that you might be interested in. Uh, Copperhall Bailiff's summon gives enemy units minus one attack, which can be good to pop Aegis units, pop Aegises, as well as reduce uh, the damage from swarms of tokens. Overall, I think this is probably just worse than another Lightning Storm or Hailstorm, but it's a, it does leave a guy who sticks around, um, so I wouldn't completely rule it out if the meta dictates it. And Steward of the Past, uh, his, you know, a 3-5 deadly body is kind of irrelevant. You're playing him for the summon, silence, all units in the enemy void. That is the primary appeal of this card if reanimation type strategies or haunting scream type strategies are very common. Next, some of these attachments. Let's talk about Citywide Ban. This is kind of a card similar to Reign of Frogs, actually, where you're trying to disrupt what the opponent is able to play. Generally, these, these two cards, Reign of Frogs and Citywide Ban, go into your market as just a one-of. So if, you're, if you decide not to play the Genov Merchant and maybe you want to play Winchest Merchant or Caradon Merchant, um, you might want to consider Citywide Ban if there's a Winchest Merchant. 
Uh, but I probably wouldn't play this in the main because it's quite bad against aggressive decks and even some mid-range decks. It's not very good. Azendel's Gift. This card is less good than you think it is. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, this is the ultimate trump card in removal matchups. Not so much. In this deck, you can cast Azendel's Gift on them and then they discard their hand and then every time they draw a threat, they just play their threat. And you probably just made them discard a handful of removal that was dead anyway. It's much better in traditional Feln decks where the opponent is holding a handful of removal and then you Azendel's Gift them, they discard it all, and now you top or now you play your Champion of Cunning, which they have one top deck to answer, which is very unlikely. So we don't really most of the cards they're gonna be discarding were dead anyway. And we don't really have a very fast clock to take advantage of the fact that they're just top decking one card at a time and top decking it playing it. So overall I tend to shy away from Azendel's gift. Uh, but it might be valuable as a one-of in the market if you're playing the Shadow Merchant. Sabotage. Let's talk about Sabotage and Shakedown kind of as a paired together. Uh, sabotage, very good against control decks or decks with relic weapons. An armory deck, for instance. Um, you know, it'll take out a lot of those pesky cards. But sometimes they reveal their hand and it's a handful of removal spells and you said, well, those are all dead anyway. So I wouldn't go overboard on the sabotages, unless the meta really shifts towards armory. At which point, you probably don't want to play this deck anyway, because it's pretty bad against an armory deck. Uh, but sabotage is nice. Um, it's a nice one to, to think about uh, in small numbers. Shakedown, on the other hand, I don't like it. Um, the reason... Uh, everyone's like, oh yeah, this is the new, the new hotness out of the Into Shadows campaign. But in our deck, it's actually not very good. Because there's, if we're playing it against an aggro deck, for instance, you can take a relevant card, but then they get the replace it because of the nightfall effect. Uh, and you also take a damage from the nightfall. And remember, we're playing against an aggro deck here, so that's not really ideal. You don't want to be taking extra damage against an aggro deck. Against control decks or mid range decks, pretty much nothing that costs three or less you care about against those decks. Against aggro decks, you do. But against those bigger decks, there's nothing that's really that threatening that costs three or less. Uh, I mean, perhaps like Teacher of Humility, but there are better answers to Teacher of Humility than hoping to get a shakedown on turn one. And we don't even have that many uh, power that'll enter play undepleted on turn one to even cast this right away. So I'm going to sh shy away from shakedown. Uh, the next, let's talk about Backlash and Unseal kind of paired together here. As a general matter, uh, just like the Sabotage Shakedown debate, Backlash is worse than Unseal. So Backlash does have the deal 2 damage, but it's limited to only sorry, it's limited to only spells. Whereas Unseal can also hit curses. What curses are important? Really just Azendel's gift is the main one. Although in a real pinch, disciplinary weights does get played on you from a teacher of humility. So if you somehow don't have removal spell but you have an unseal. You know, you do what you gotta do. Uh, Backlash's effect, deal two damage, is once again good against um, armory decks that have relic weapons, or decks that have face aegis that you really just need to pop that face aegis to get through your other Channel of the Tempest, or Sabotage, or Lightning Strike. Uh, but overall, I think Unseal is going to be more generally applicable. Corrupt. Corrupt is a kind of a joke card, um, but I've seriously considered it in a meta where you know, if this deck becomes very meta and very popular, it can be very nice to steal an opposing channel of Tempest and redirect it right back at them so that you draw all the cards. But overall, this is uh, very rarely going to be played. Vision of Austerity, on the other hand, is going to very commonly be played as a one of in your market if you're running either Genev or Winchest Merchant. It's kind of the premier anti-relic card, and if a lot of relics are very common in the meta, you might even want to add one in the main. Burglarize is probably not a main deck kind of card, but if you do need that relic uh, hate in your market and you decide to run the Shadow Merchant instead, this will be a pretty good replacement for Vision. The Nightfall is not really great because, as we discussed with Shakedown, Nightfall is generally bad for you because it also kills your, your weapons. Uh, things like Auric Runehammer or Last Word, really. 
So if you're going to play Burglarize, try to stay away from those ones. Long Live the Queen. Um, this card is, you know, holding open two power for Unseal or Backlash is a reasonable ask to counter a spell. Holding open four, a little less so. It's quite good against control decks. Countering their spell and drawing a card uh, is good because they, they really aren't going to punish you for holding open four mana multiple turns. But in general, it, it's much, much worse against aggressive or mid-range decks who will punish you for holding open that extra power. So unless the meta is very heavily controlled, I'd stay away from this one. Reign of Frogs we kind of discussed with Citywide Ban, but uh, it used to be a core card to the deck because because of how long the, the games go with this deck, you have um, you, the deck, the games kind of devolve into my whole deck versus your whole deck, rather than, you know, my hand and the cards I draw in the first five turns versus your hand and the cards you draw in the first five turns. It becomes full deck versus full deck because you generally will draw enough cards and have enough power to play everything throughout your whole deck. And Reign of Frogs kind of reduces that uh, quantity of threats in the opposing deck. You can hopefully take out their big threat like an Akaria or their Sword of the Sky King or against mid-range decks take out a Heart of the Vaults or something along those lines. So that now they just have less possible options. If you're running the Gen of Merchant, I definitely would put one in the market. And if you're not running the Gen of Merchant, I'd probably play one in the main. And if you are running Gen of Merchant, you might even want one in the main as well. It It is definitely an applicable card in a lot of situations. Also, there's a lot of uh, Talir combos been popping up, some combo decks that rely on very specific cards. So if you can hit one of their key cards with Reign of Frogs, that can be very devastating and potentially just gives you a free win. And last but not least, the original win condition of the deck, Solitude. Back when I initially devised uh, this kind of unitless control deck, Solitude was the way to win, along with Excavate to bring it back and mill them twice. Uh, unfortunately, it's just generally going to be worse than Sword of the Sky King or Channel of the Tempest, because those cards help you to stabilize the board in addition to winning the game. Solitude does not do that. Solitude just tries to win you the game, and at that it's kind of inefficient. So it's nice to keep in the back of your mind in case, you know, uh, a crazy meta takes hold, but I couldn't go through this whole deck without talking about Solitude at least a little bit. So um, that's pretty much every card that I've ever considered playing in the Tin Pile deck. So let me talk real quick about the power base, and then I will be done. This video is already going on quite a bit, so I will uh, try to try to wrap it up quickly here. So power influence uh, or power is uh, somewhat difficult in this deck. Um, you have things like double justice with harsh rule, and end of the story, or or Grunhammer. You've got Quad Primal for Channel of Tempest, but also Double Primal much earlier for Wisdom of the Elders. You've got uh, Triple Shadow with Last Word, and if you're running Extract, that's Double Shadow on turn three. So with that in mind, you really want to avoid playing many sigils that kind of only give you one, one influence at a time. But in order to accommodate things like Vara's Favor, or Seek Power, or Island's Favor as some power of choice, uh, you do need some number. I'm currently running 2 Justice, 2 Primal, 3 Shadow. Arguably, I should probably add an extra Primal or Shadow, um, but I'm not entirely sure. But overall, you're going to want about 33 power sources. So I run 25 power, plus 4 Seek power, plus 1 Island's Favor, and 3 Vara's Favor. So that's 25 plus 4 is 29, plus 1 is 30, plus 3 is 33. If you're going to run more Channel the Tempests, you probably want to bump that up even higher to maybe 34. Maybe add an extra sigil or power. Uh, or an extra Vars favor along with the shadow sigil. You're going to always want four Cobalt Waystones. Faced Aegis is just that good. Um, honestly, maybe I should put this in the core section, but Cobalt Waystone, always want four of. 
Other than that, you're going to want to play a lot of crests. So I run uh, almost the max number of crests, four order, three vengeance, four cunning. In general, you can afford to play these. Uh, you can afford to play them. The, the depleted doesn't really affect you because you know, you're just doing nothing for the couple, early couple turns anyway. And you can generally remove their units at value or uh, yeah, at value where, you know, okay, they play a four drop and you played a crest and slay it. And they play a five drop and then you play a crest and feeding time it or something along those lines. So um, the depleted is not all that important, but the scout, it can be definitely helpful to uh, make sure you keep on hitting your power every turn because one of the easiest ways to lose a game as a control deck is to miss your power. You want to hit power every turn from turn one to turn nine. And if you're, you know, if you don't have enough, you can scout things to the bottom that aren't power. Uh, but in the dark, if you're playing against a, an opposing, uh, you know, an opponent who you don't know, you know, you're on ladder, you're going first, you don't know. And your hand is pretty good. You know, you've got three or four power couple removal spells, maybe a card draw. Uh, don't play the crest on turn one. Just don't. Um, you don't know what you're trying to scout for. What if you like are doing that and you see a harsh rule? You're like, well, I don't know if I'm playing against a mid-range deck, in which case I don't want it. Maybe they're a control deck, which I don't want it. I don't know. What if it's a power? Well, you're going to keep it on top. Uh, what if it's a card draw spell? You're going to keep it on top. What if it's removal? You're going to keep it on top. You're almost always going to keep the card on top, and any card that you might put on bottom it's a 50-50, whether you want to put it on bottom or not. So unless you're really, you know what you're up against, or uh, you're kind of trying to dig for another power, uh, I would avoid playing Crests on turn one in the dark. And I think that wraps it all up. Wow, uh, this video went long, but I hope that was informative. Please make sure you check out the written version, which is linked in the description below. Uh, I have told you everything about the card choices I know about Tin Pile. Haven't even touched on gameplay. So for that, check out my other videos, check out my Twitch, which is also linked below, uh, as I go through some gameplay of this. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I will see you next time.